And uh, we'll head back up to the roof to check on our roof garden. And we'll take you behind the scenes to the Air Traffic Control Center. All that and a lot more tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody. Join us. Bye. Fair's regular admission price. Come, stay till midnight. It's a laugh going up. It's a scream coming down. It's the biggest family day around. I'm Diane Williams, national founder of the United Scleroderma Foundation. Little is known about the cause of scleroderma, but its effects are staggering. Scleroderma literally means hard skin and is an incurable and possibly fatal disease. To learn more, call your Twin Cities chapter at 644-0508. KSTP-TV, St. Paul, Minneapolis. <laughs> I'm Sharon Anderson. And I'm Gary Lumpkin. And coming up today on Good Company, Dr. William Nolan will be here with some advice for women on how to recognize and how to treat anemia. And the president of the University of Minnesota is moving on. Peter and Diane McGraw are here to tell us about their decision. And field reporter Beth Wood will show us how we can all save money by picking our own fruits and vegetables. And Gary is going in search of Minnesota enemy number one, the mosquito. And we'll also meet an author who will give us an inside look Four generations of the Kennedy family. All that and more on Good Company. Stay with us. Thank you. From the Twin Cities, it's Good Company. With your hosts, Steve Adelman and Sharon Anderson. Field hosts, Gary Lumpkin. Gary Schendel, and field reporter Beth Wood. And now, Steve and Sharon. Welcome to Good Company, everybody. Gary Lumpkin is filling in today. Steve Edelman and my husband, Steve, has been called out of town for a few days. So Gary has been kind enough to come in on the first day of his vacation to fill in. Thank yeah, it was. You. It was supposed to be uh, vacation time. But this is, this will sound corny, but this is a lot of fun doing this part of the show. I don't get to do all this that often. So this is kind of a, a good way to spend some of my vacation time. And we don't time. get to work together that often. You're Almost, always out in the field. Yeah, I'm always in here. Very seldom. Kind of passing in the uh, corridor sometimes, and that's about as close as we get. So, so we'll have fun today. We are going to have fun. Got a lot of good stuff. We do indeed. Mm -hmm. First of all, we're going to be talking to uh, Peter McGraw and his wife, Diane. Now, last Monday, we all read in the paper and heard on the television that he decided he was moving on. He's leaving the Univers University of Minnesota, going on to the University of Missouri, starting on January 1st. Well, what went into that decision, we're going to find out today. Would you please welcome C. Peter McGraw and his wife, Diane. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, how do you feel? Excited, apprehensive? What about the move? Well, after all the nice things that uh, most people have been saying, I, I'm beginning to reconsider and think maybe, <laughs> maybe we should stay a while longer here. <laughs> we have a scoop here. You're going to change your mind right here on Good Company? Well, sure. probably not. No. <laughs> What were the factors that went into this decision? Well, there's no one single factor, but uh, going back to last, uh, last fall, Diane and I had been discussing uh, the fact that we thought we were ready for a change, if not in Korea, certainly in, in location. And we rather made up our mind without being specific about uh, moving to, to another place, uh, perhaps another university presidency or some other a uh, job in higher education or something where, uh, in my case, my talents might, might be a match. And uh, I really made up my mind last, uh, late last fall and, and certainly by December that when the right thing, whatever it might be, would uh, come along that uh, we, would make, uh, we would make a change. And uh, without getting too specific, uh, I was in discussion with four or five other uh, enterprises, let's put it that way, back in, into the uh, middle of the spring. And then the Missouri thing came up uh, uh, in early, uh, late April or uh, in early May, and it was just, uh, I just got uh, stimulated by the notion of another university presidency, and what, I like this part of America. What made Missouri seem appealing uh, as opposed to the other ones that were approaching you? The other, uh, they were, what, universities and businesses? Uh, univ the ones that I was in discussion with were higher, higher education related. Mm -hmm. well, I think Diane can answer Why Missouri, the Missouri yeah. thing as well as I can. Well, from my point of view, I backing up just a bit, I could see that Peter was losing some of his enthusiasm for this job already a year ago. And so the notion of moving on felt real good, but the problem is that I thought we'd go private. I thought we'd live in the Twin Cities and our daughter could go to the same school and we'd, we'd you know, become a normal family. 
So my notion really was to stay put, but get out of the business of public life. And uh, it just clearly wasn't like that, Sharon, because Peter got so excited when he heard about Missouri. It was a complete match. You see, in his business, it's no fun to go to some place where all the pieces are in order and there's, there's no work to be done. Oh. And here, I think that he feels his job is complete. Doesn't mean there isn't a lot to be done by a new leader and new direction, but for him, his work is done. Mm -hmm. And I can see a buoyancy and an enthusiasm and an excitement that he hasn't had since we were married six years ago, so I know it's right. And our daughter's excited about it, and the people of Missouri have treated us beautifully, yeah. just like at home here. But how about for you, though? Now, you're from Duluth, and you've, you've grown up and lived in Minnesota your whole life. This hard, is a big hard. move for you. But as, as we visited in Missouri, I had to say, people are good everywhere, and life is what you make it. And I think because we're going to gain as a family, a lot of people don't realize, but this new position is a system job for Peter. He doesn't have the direct control of a large campus like here, plus other campuses. He has a chancellor, or they have a chancellor for each of the four campuses, mm -hmm. and he's over that. We think we're going to see more of him, and we also think we're going to have a bit of a more private life. How are you going to make this move work for you? Because you're very involved here in the university and the community. I've just completed a book called The President's Spouse, Volunteer or Volunteered, which comes out this week and has been co-authored by several spouses across the country. So I'm going to go back and reread my own book to find out <laughs> how you move and how do you do it with graciousness. How to make it work. Um, I negotiated with Peter very early, and he's promised Mo, that Mo and I could come for two months every summer to our cabin you know, within this area, so I won't lose my contacts here. And that's important. I also hope to find a part-time job like I have here in Campfire. I'm the executive director of Minneapolis Council of Campfire with uh -huh. a colleague, Jane Hanger Seeley. So once I get us moved, I, I hope to find something exciting. And that will be a good way to meet people as well. You bet. Yeah. yeah. You bet. Are there mistakes you made here that you don't want to repeat? Well, uh, I sure make mistakes because I haven't found the man or woman who, uh, who doesn't. Um, but uh, every situation is different. And what I think I, I can bring to, uh, uh, I don't know, it's a different circumstance, and I, I hope I have learned from my experiences uh, here, which have been basically, not just basically, but fundamentally, overall, very positive for mm -hmm. me. I think I bring experience uh, to the University of Missouri. I've had knowledge of that university for a long time. I've had ties and friends there, and many years ago, I even considered a job on the Columbia campus. So it's, it's not out of context. It's a public university. I believe in public higher education, even as I respect, of course, the private sector. I believe in land-grant education. I think I bring experience and uh, relative youthfulness and, uh, and rejuvenation and, and vigor. And I don't have to worry about uh, football anymore. The chance is worried about that. I don't hire and fire football <laughs> coaches, so that'll be a new experience for me. That's not a concern anymore. Not yeah. a concern anymore, at least very indirectly. Yeah. And he has a lot of energy. He just completed Grandma's Marathon. Also, I'm more proud see, of that I than didn't I realize am. you did that. He his own time. Do you want to know the time? I, it was a personal best by 14 minutes. I made it in three hours, 27 minutes, uh, 57, 100 seconds. I'm more <laughs> proud of that than anything else. Good I for you. you. I think you should be. That's incredible. It's going to be awfully hot running in Missouri, though, isn't it? Well, I'm going to run early in the morning. You are. You're yes, going to keep in, it up in the summertime. Sure. In the wintertime, it'll be okay. Yeah. Well, congratulations you to you much. on that. That's terrific, and, and we're going to miss you. Well, we'll miss, uh, you. We'll miss this area we'll and the state. You. It's a great state, and we haven't quite gone yet. We'll be around for a few more months. And you all have been very good to us, Sharon, and I want to thank you on Good Company for touring the house, caring about us as a couple, and also to Stan Hubbard, who is a very special friend of the universities. If we can find friends like that in Missouri, we'll be okay. I'm right. sure you will. Good. And check up, uh, we'll check up on you when you're back here, okay? Good. Check in we'll with us. We'll stay in touch. We okay. sure will. Good, Good luck you. to you. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Thank you. We'll be right back. <laughs> bags. There's never been a better time or a better reason to go Greyhound. Go Greyhound from Minneapolis to Duluth for only $13.50. Or from Minneapolis to Milwaukee for as low as $28.55. Pack your bags, America, because this summer you have even more good reasons to go Greyhound and leave the driving to us. Mom's got the cue for 
summertime blues. Nestle Toll House Pan Cookies and Ice Cream. A summer treat you bake in a pan in 20 minutes with Nestle Toll House Morsels. Cool. Easy. Yummy. Fun. Nestle Toll House Pan Cookies and Ice Cream. Mom's got the cure for the summertime blues. It's amazing how you feel each and every time you taste Yoplait, the yogurt of France. Falling in love again, oh yes, it's true. You can't resist Yoplait's creamy smoothness. What am I to do? The real fruit mixed all through. The taste is truly extraordinary. I can't help it. Get a little taste of Yoplait, the yogurt of France. Burger King talks to a future customer. Hi there. I bet you're getting tired of applesauce, aren't you? I tell you what, let's think about hamburgers. Yeah, the juicy flame broiled kind, like at Burger King. Let's think about those delicious juices dripping down. That hot, sizzling beef leaves you speechless, doesn't it? The only thing is, you'll have to wait a little while to try one. But only a year, or two, maybe three. No, we didn't. We're back. We are back. We're just uh, talking there. Uh, I'm not sure if you may have seen this before. You probably have. Up on the roof here, we have our own KSTP Good Company rooftop garden. And uh, a week or so ago, Steve and Sharon were, were on vacation, and I got to... Uh, harvest oh, it. How is it up there? Oh, it's it's absolutely great. Did you get great. some vegetables we, from it? We, we made our own little salad, and uh, I didn't think you knew this. <gasps> you, you got that salad? I know. You you had been doing all the work and the setup all spring about how to do the garden, and then I got to harvest it while you guys were... Was it good? We, we, oh, it's great. Yeah. It was great. And, of course, um, for the next few months, there'll be all types of fruit and vegetables from from uh, backyard gardens, as well as uh, major farms are, will now be bringing their produce out onto the market. But, you know, if you're not able to have a garden of your own, like we are lucky here at the at Good Company. A little bitty one, yeah. Yeah, you can't have your own. There are some ways to still save money, and that involves picking your own. Now, Beth Wood went out recently and showed us how you can go locally and pick your own fruits and vegetables and save money. Let's take a look. Today, I'm going to show you how to save money on fresh fruits and vegetables this summer by visiting what's called a pick-your-own farm. Right now, I'm at Clemens Farm. This is about 20 miles northwest of the Twin Cities, and it's one of hundreds of pick-your-own farms across the state. In fact, later on, I'm going to be telling you where to pick up these free booklets that give you the locations of all these farms. But first, let's go out in the field. Now, I always thought about the only thing you could pick at Pick Your Own Farms were strawberries and raspberries. Well, not true, because almost anything, fruit or vegetable, that's grown in Minnesota is available at all these Pick Your Own Farms. For instance, I just picked some fresh spinach. You know, it's about the end of the spinach season, but in July and August, there will be tons of fruits and vegetables available, and the prices will be right, too. For instance, this spinach that I just picked is only 30 cents a pound. Now, that's a lot less than you'd find it for in supermarkets. And I've even heard that later on this summer, tomatoes are going to be available for as low as 12 cents a pound. Another thing you want to do when you come to one of these farms is come prepared. For instance, bring along a paper bag or maybe even a bushel basket so you have a place to put what you've picked. Also, I have brought along a knife because a lot of fruits and vegetables need a knife to get them out of the ground. Another good idea, wear your grubby clothes. Look at my knees. They are absolutely filthy, but I am having a great time, and I have just spotted my favorite vegetable. Look, fresh broccoli. You know, not only is picking your own inexpensive, but when you pick something fresh out of a farm or garden, it always seems to taste better, too, doesn't it? You know, to find these farms, I want to show you how to get these pamphlets that I told you about earlier. The first one I'm holding right now is a directory that's published by the Minnesota Board of Tourism. It also lists where you can find roadside stands and farmers markets, and there's over 400 listings. Now, to get your copy of this pamphlet, it's free, call this number, 296-5029, inside the metropolitan area. Then outside, you can call toll-free, 1-800-652-9747. 
Then there's also this pamphlet that's available free at your local libraries, and it's sponsored by the Metropolitan Growers Association. And inside this pamphlet, you can get a coupon that's good for a dollar off on any $10 purchase at any of these area farms. And I have one last tip. These pamphlets also list the phone numbers of all the Pick Your Own Farms and Roadside Stands located around the area. And it's a good idea to call the farms first to find out what vegetables are available because the abundance of crops can vary with the seasons and the weather. Mm. Good advice. Good advice. Now, Beth also told us it's, a, <clears throat> excuse me, it's also a good idea to call ahead because some places do not uh, allow children or pets. But others do, and it can be a family outing, but you should call it uh, in advance for more information about availability and what they allow. All right. Great way to spend a day with your family if you can find a place that takes everybody. At, at uh, 12 cents a pound, it'd be a good way to get oh, tomatoes. That's great. We'll be right back. Coming up in the next half hour on Good Company, we'll announce more super bargains, including a 50% off deal for donut lovers. And our field host, Gary Lumpkin, goes in search of Minnesota enemy number one, the mosquito. And we'll give you an inside look at the four generations of the Kennedy family. Coming up next, Surgeon Dr. William Nolan with advice for women on how to recognize and treat anemia. Stay with us for more good company. Time takes you beyond the news. Time flies and you are there. Time flies and lets you care. When you read Time each week, you know more. You understand. Throughout your world, throughout your land, Time puts it all right in your hand. Read Time and understand. The Carlton brings out the stars in Minnesota. Come to a rowdy party June 28th and 29th with Hank Williams, Jr. Queen of my heart. June 30th, it's Roy Orbison. Pretty woman. July 8th, trumpet virtuoso Wynton Marsalis. <laughs> July 11th through the 14th, John and Donald Mills and Patty Page. Call the Carlton at 854-9300 for reservations. The art of the perfectly ironed shirt. For those who appreciate it, we've created the CMAC ironing system. We designed it with more steam. We designed it to shape every curve, every tuck, meticulously, in order to take ironing from a chore to an accomplishment. Understandably, this makes CMAC rather expensive, but that's what happens when you're a perfectionist, designing for perfectionists. Perfectionists can find this CMAC at Dayton's. In just a moment, we'll be talking with Dr. William Nolan about anemia, uh, how women can recognize it and how to treat it. But first, today is Monday and we have three super bargains. Now, our first super bargain today is a super entertainment deal at the Omni Theater in St. Paul. Now, you're looking at it right there, and the Omni Theater at the Science Museum of Minnesota is in St. Paul, and they're offering our good company viewers a super deal on tickets to both the museum and two of their shows. Now, if you go to the Omni Theater today or tomorrow and ask for the super bargain, you will get tickets to either of their current features, Behold Hawaii, which you're just seeing parts of there, or their ever-popular production of Genesis. That is only being shown during the summer, Genesis is, and usually cost, the tickets are usually $5.50, but they're now $2.50 as space permits. Now, the tickets will entitle you to visit the Science Museum exhibit of Wolves also. Now, admission, of course, is first come, first serve, and there are the phone numbers for reservations 221-9456, or 221-9400 for the Omni Theater. And we should point out, of course, that to get the Super Bargain, you must ask for it today or tomorrow. It's 250 Now, that also applies. They normally have discounts on senior, si senior citizens and children's tickets, but all tickets will be 250 for the uh, Super Bargain. So that's a good one. And as I said before, Dr. William Nolan is here to talk to us about anemia and how it affects uh, women. Sharon is with him. Sharon, Dr. Nolan. Thank you, Gary. Welcome, Dr. Nolan. Thank you, Sharon. Back again. Anemia, uh, now we're talking about women and anemia. Is it exclusive to women? Well, it's not exclusive to women, but uh, it's uh, a very common problem in women, much more common in women than in men. Iron deficiency anemia, that's what we always hear about. Is that what anemia well, is? Well, uh, that's one of the kinds of anemia, yeah, iron deficiency anemia. It's probably the most common kind. And uh, 
The reason that it's most common in women uh, is fairly obvious. I mean, women, uh, particular, women menstruate, and so they lose a couple of ounces of blood at least uh, every month. And as a result of that, they lose iron from their bodies, and that has to be uh, ingested in the food in order to build the blood back up again. You can't, you can't build blood unless you've got iron in your mm -hmm. diet. And uh, men, of course, don't lose blood very often, uh, unless they get a cut or something like that, or they have a tumor that's bleeding. Uh, but women, even healthy women, will lose some blood every month. So what is anemia then, is well, it? Well, anemia is a, is a low blood level, a low red blood cell count. Okay. And you see, the red blood cells are the blood cells that carry oxygen to all parts of the body. Now, to make red blood cells, you have to have iron. That's part of it, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is made up of iron and the protein. To, to make it, you have to have the iron. Now, if you don't have it, you can't carry oxygen to all the parts of the body. So what do you get? Well, guess what you would get. If you can't get oxygen to your brain, you get dizzy. You get mm -hmm. lightheaded. If you can't get enough oxygen to the muscles of the body, the heart has to beat faster, and you get palpitations. If you can't get enough oxygen to your body in general, you're feeling tired, mm -hmm. you're feeling all worn out. All of those things happen because you're not getting enough oxygen, and you're not getting enough oxygen because you don't have enough blood, and you don't have enough blood because you don't have enough iron in your diet. That's the most common sequence. What's the cause then? Just not eating enough foods with iron in? Well, there's iron is in almost every kind of food, but uh, you have to, we only absorb about 10% of the iron. For, for about, if you eat a balanced diet, a well-balanced diet, and you're not having heavy menstrual periods, uh, extraordinarily heavy menstrual periods, then you will probably be able to maintain your blood level at, a, at its normal uh, level, which is 12 grams uh -huh. uh, uh, of uh, hemoglobin uh, per 100 cc's. Uh, but if you don't, uh, then you need iron supplements. And about 10% of women will be chronically anemic. And uh, they'll come to your office, they'll say, I'm tired, I'm worn out, I don't know what's the matter with me, and you check their blood level and it's low. And so you put them on iron supplements and that uh, changes the picture immediately. Now checking the blood level, is that just a prick in the finger or little, is that the whole lot no, of blood? No, it's just a little prick in the finger. The test costs about four dollars and uh, it's worth doing. If a woman comes to see me and she's complaining of being all tired out, uh, if she looks a little pale or she tells me she's got palpitations or that she gets dizzy uh, very easily, then one of the things that every doctor will do, I think, is to check her blood level. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a, a very simple test and it's very profitable. You know, television seems to tell us that uh, it's very likely that we have iron poor blood yeah. and we should just go out and take an iron supplement no matter what. What do well, you think about that? Well, I, I think that's wrong. Uh, I think that it, actually it's only 10% of women that get anemic. That, that's a lot of women, of course, mm -hmm. but it's still 90% don't need these iron supplements. I mean, I know the ones you're thinking of. These pictures of, uh, you know, here I am, me and my daughter, and by God, you know, you can't guess which is the daughter and which is her because they're taking Geritol. That's right. And I mean, geez, that's right. honestly, I, I mean, want to look I, like that. Yeah, I want to feel that good. Oh, good. I'd like to buy some, but you know, I get to look like my kids. But I mean, it's just a big rip-off. These women go and they think, well, by God, if I'm going to look like my daughter, I'll buy some Geritol. Can it hurt? And it's not going to make them look like Can it hurt, though, if you take an iron salt? Well, if you take too much, it, what'll hurt is your pocketbook. I mean, you don't need it. It's not going to do you any real good. So why are you wasting your money on iron or vitamins that you don't need? You know, enough is plenty. Uh, you, after you get... Uh, a certain number of vitamins into you, everything else just goes right through you. Yeah. It's, uh, I so think, it's just a waste of money and Yeah, I mean, uh, it, yeah, it is. It really is. We have uh, on Chiron, let's take a look at the recap mm. of some of the symptoms of, of uh, anemia. Just so if you have these problems, you can check it out with mm. your doctor. Pale well, in color. Pale in color. You go like mm. this. If it's white, it shouldn't be. It should be red. And shortness of breath, that's again because you're you're getting out of wind easily, lightheadedness, again, you're not getting enough oxygen in your brain, and the rapid heart rate, palpitations, uh, that's all part of the fact that your heart's pumping faster to shove the little bit of blood it's got around so you can get enough oxygen. So, I've got this right, you sh if you suspect it, you should see your doctor, and if uh, it is true that you have uh, anemia, he will probably He'll prescribe probably put you or on she an will iron prescribe supplement. an iron supplement. Yeah, and if you're on some kooky diet, which most of us are at one time or another, then you've got to be really careful. And if you're a vegetarian, <laughs> then you really have to be <laughs> not careful. Not too fond of vegetarians. Vegetarians, well, they have to be very smart in order not to get uh, into trouble with, their, with anemia. So pay great attention to your iron 
Right, iron, and vitamin B12, folic acid, all those things, but mostly iron. Okay, great. Dr. William Nolan, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Coming up tomorrow on Good Company, we'll review a new restaurant that just opened in Dayton 700 under the mall. Also, find out about some new exercises that can be done to relieve stress on the job. And field host Gary Schendel shows us the latest in home computers. Coming up next, field host Gary Lumpkin goes in search of Minnesota public enemy number one, the mosquito. That's just ahead. What does it take to make a great shake? Thick, flowing flavors like luscious strawberry, tangy pineapple, and thick, rich, delicious chocolate swirling deep into a pool that's light, refreshing, and oh so cool and creamy smooth. There's only one place to get a shake this great. In the land of Dairy Queen, we drink the land. Kemp's Summertime Limited Edition. Peaches and Cream Ice Cream. Special summertime goodness. Made with perfectly ripe peaches. Big chunks and tiny slices blended into creamier, smoother Kemp's ice cream. Fresh peaches and cream never tasted better. But hurry, it's for summertime only. Kemp's Peaches and Cream. A special limited edition ice cream from Kemp's that tastes as good as you think it will. Are the kids asleep? You have no Get ready for a big seal test treat. Polar Bar Ice Cream Squares, made with luscious seal test vanilla ice cream. And Polar Bar Ice Cream Squares have a rich coating, made with real milk chocolate. Mm. I'd love another. Polar Bar, the big seal test treat. So good, adults want to keep it for themselves. Beginning Monday on Eyewitness Afternoon, if you've got problems keeping your money, join us. We'll show you how to make it and how to hang on to it. Also next week, we'll talk handwriting with Dr. Marilyn Mason. We'll find out why one suburban Twin City company imports mud from Europe, and we'll tour some of the major cities of the south central part of the nation, good spots for vacations. All that next week. Join us Monday at 4.30 for Eyewitness Afternoon. Picnicking yet this season? Have you been on a picnic yet this season? Um, that's one of the things I'm going to do this week. I think, Are you? Where I get some time off. I got something for you. Okay. Here's something to take on your picnic. This is our second super bargain of the day. Let's take a look at it. It is a super picnic jug deal. It's being offered to us by Kokesh. Now, Kokesh has four Twin Cities locations, and they're getting us all ready for the Fourth of July with a super bargain on one of their most popular picnic jugs. Now, all four Kokesh stores are stocked with your favorite summer sports equipment and clothing, and here's what they're offering us today. If you go to any location today or tomorrow and ask for the Super Bargain, you will get that. It's a half-gallon picnic jug. It goes everywhere, the golf course, the beach, picnics, whatever. It's insulated. It has a snap cap to keep the beverages colder longer. It has a wide mouth for uh, easy filling for hot or cold items, and there's a three-year warranty on that from Gott. They're a limit of two per customer, and that's the deal. Normally, they are $4.99 each. You can get them for $2.49 each today and tomorrow while supplies last. As I said, there's a limit of two per customer, but that is really a good deal if you want to get ready for picnic season. Kokesh locations, Hopkins, Maplewood Plaza, Southview Square, and South Town Center. So if you're in the market for some picnic jugs to get ready for the 4th of July and the rest of the summer's picnics, go into Kokesh and be sure to ask for the good company super bargain in order to get that half-price deal. Mm. Some food coming up later on in a super bargain, but first... You mentioned, you mentioned picnics, and the whole idea, of course, along with the picnics, we're looking at it behind us, there are mosquitoes being out and about uh -huh. and enjoying. That's a, a phenomenon, of course, we experience every year here in yes. Minnesota. And I wanted to do a little background and, and learn as much as I could. For example, the mosquito control people here, just in the seven-county Twin Cities area, spend over $6 million a year controlling the mosquitoes. So as, as, as bad as they may be from time to time, there really is a lot going in to controlling the mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And they work hand in hand with the, the, from the ecological standpoint, from the people with DNR. And I, and I really did. It was, it's a uh, fascinating, actually, as much as we hate mosquitoes, learning about them. But let me show you what happened when, when I went and in, got involved in this study. Because 
I was after facts, but, well, take a look. This is the city. Actually, it's the Twin Cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. Most of the time, it's pretty ordinary. But sometimes, unusual things happen that need to be reported. That's where I come in. My name's Lumpkin. I carry a microphone. I'm a field host. It was a Wednesday morning. I had been working the day watch out of good company when I was assigned to go and meet a lady named Smith. Are you Smith? Yeah, are you Lumpkin? That's right. They said you'd be coming. What could I tell you? Just the facts, ma'am. Well, it was the biggest one I've ever seen. And how big was that, ma'am? Ah, uh, gee, it must have been like this. You sure about that? Hey, I know what I saw. And what would that be, ma'am? No question about it. It was a giant mosquito. Eleven forty-nine. I checked around and discovered other people had also seen a strange creature. Just like the Smith woman, they all said it was a giant mosquito. 1234. I met with DNR biologist Ron Lawrence, who immediately questioned the whole thing. I'm sorry, Gary, there's just no way. How's that? Mosquitoes don't get that big. Oh, yeah? Yeah, people make jokes every year about the big mosquitoes, especially the ones they claim to see in the boundary waters. But the fact is, the biggest any mosquito gets is about a quarter of an inch long. And that's the fact? Yeah, that's the fact. <laughs> I then went back downtown because another sighting had been reported. I was looking for a man named Jones. Are you Jones? Yep, that's me. You called about seeing a giant mosquito? Sure did, but it was a lot more than just seeing it. You want to tell me about it? Well, I really don't know where to begin. Just give me the facts. Oh, oh sure. It landed right here on my arm. On your arm? Yeah, right on my arm. But that's the funny part. What do you mean? Well, it was so big, I was really scared. But it didn't bite me. It didn't? No, it just stood there for a second or two, and then it grabbed a hunk of lettuce and flew away. Lettuce? Oh, yeah, I almost forgot. I was eating a salad at the time. Two twenty-two. I went back to the fields to talk with Ron Lawrence about this new but puzzling information. It didn't puzzle Ron at all. Gary, I still don't believe the size those people claim, but I do know one thing now. Oh, yeah? What's that? The sex. Come again? The sex of the mosquito. I know the sex. Uh-huh. It's a male mosquito. You sure about that? Sure, I'm sure. Most people don't realize this, but only the females bite. Huh. Male mosquitoes don't bite people. Male mosquitoes don't bite anything. They just hang around and suck plant juices. Huh. With the lettuce, it all fits. How's that? Our mosquito. He's a vegetarian. Fifty-six. I decided to spend more time with Ron to learn all I could about mosquitoes. You know, Gary, there are over 50 species of mosquitoes in the Twin Cities area alone. Uh, but the majority of species that bite people breed in temporary floodwater areas like this. And for the most part, uh, these mosquitoes are not uh, disease-bearing mosquitoes. They breed in other places. Well, I'm pretty sure there's probably water in this tire, Gary. And uh, there's probably mosquitoes breeding in here. Uh, Let's see if we can find some. If you find some, what's different about these mosquitoes than the other ones? Well, this particular mosquito has the potential for carrying disease. Uh, in this case, uh, encephalitis. Oh, so all of these mosquitoes have disease? The mosquitoes aren't full of disease. They have a potential for transmitting disease from an animal or another human to a human being. So how do they do that? Well, they bite an animal or a human that's already infected, and then they transmit the disease to an uninfected human being. Huh. That's interesting. Well, sounds like a good tip for all of us around the house would be then, if you've got tires and tin cans around your house, things that collect water, clean them up. And that way you'll clean up the mosquitoes at the same time.
stole the lettuce. Hi, are you finding everything? Uh, yes, miss. You work here? Sure do. What's the trouble? Mosquitoes. Mosquitoes? That's right, ma'am. Mosquitoes. These mosquitoes. Any missing? Missing mosquitoes? Yes, miss. Any missing mosquitoes? No, I, I don't think so. Could be you've made a mistake, miss, about missing mosquitoes. Oh, really? Yes, miss, that's right. Unless I've missed my guess, you've made a mistake, miss, about missing mosquitoes. Oh, dear. Not dear, mosquitoes. Oh. The story you have just seen is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. this week on Good Company. On Wednesday, in our studio, former First Lady Rosalind Carter tells us about life in the White House. Also on Wednesday, some advice from an expert on how to buy a used car. And on Friday, a preview of this year's Taste of Minnesota Food Fest. Coming up next, we'll give you an inside look at four generations of the Kennedy family. Stay with us. They call me a hot dog. No way. This is a hot dog. The Schweiger Tender Bite. Team! People call me a hot dog. No way. This is a hot dog. The famous Schweiger Tender Bite hot dog. Made fresh right here in Minnesota. Me a hot dog? No way. This is a hot dog. The Schweiger Tender Bite. Now this is a hot dog. The Weight Loss Clinic is celebrating their ninth anniversary, and they're passing on that celebration spirit to you by having, for a limited time only, their introductory program, which is ordinarily $98 for $49. Half price, you can take off the weight. The same way that Bev Colahan here, she called the Edina Clinic and took off 22 pounds. How do you feel? I feel wonderful. Different? I feel very, very good. How do you feel different? Um, is it more energy? Well, my attitude is uh, better about myself, and I do have much more energy than I did before. Good for you. Feel good about being thinner. What was the key to taking off the weight with the weight loss clinic? Well, I liked a lot of the features that the clinic offered, I think particularly the daily weigh-in and consultation. That was very important to me. And you get that, that good advice. Well, congratulations right. to you. Keep it off, and you can too. For limited time only, their $98 program for half price, the weight loss clinic. These kids are protected by the leading mosquito repellent, but only this one by Deep Woods Off. Now they'll try to endure the mosquito hours, the five hours from dusk to dark when thousands of bloodthirsty mosquitoes come out to bite. Within hours, the leading repellent stops working, not Deep Woods Off. Five hours later, Deep Woods Off still works. Maggie, Deep Woods Off fights bites for hours, even the mosquito hours. Looking at the pictures there of some of the Kennedy family, pretty well-known people here in the United States. And it's quite a phenomenon, the Kennedy family, the, of course, the President Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy. And they're certainly in the papers and the news today uh, with the death, the recent death of David Kennedy. And there's just a, there's a fascination on the part of American public about the Kennedy family. And there's a new book out. You take a look at the book right now. And it's called The Kennedys, an American Drama. And it's written by Peter Collier and David Horowitz. And joining us here in the studio now is, is Peter Collier. Um, welcome to Minnesota. Glad to be here. Yes. Um, as, as I was saying there, the, the, the Kennedy mystique, there really is something that has kind of captivated America, isn't there? Well, there is. I think the Kennedys are uh, all, all of our lives larger somehow. They're all of our desires larger. They're also, in some sense, uh, what we can't be. They're, they live at a, at a pitch with an intensity, with a triumphant 
quality, with a tragedy that we don't uh, ordinarily have in our own lives. Now, your book covers three, four generations of the Kennedys, um, bringing it right up to date, in fact. But the first question that comes to my mind is, come on, another book about the Kennedys. Do we need another Kennedy book? Well, I don't know. I mean, you, you do have second thoughts when you're beginning something like this. The Kennedys uh, become a kind of sub-industry in American publishing. You know, you can see the nation's forestries being devastated to get the paper to write more and more books about the Kennedys. So it, it is a daunting project, particularly, because there have been so many books. Did you get cooperation from the family? Because you did not handle this with a kid gloves approach. No, we, we went to the families originally, uh, the, uh, all of the, the various families, the Shrivers, the Smiths, uh, and the various branches of the Kennedys, uh, looking for, if not co we didn't want cooperation in the sense that some authors had had it, because I mean, one of the problems with Kennedy literature is there's been too many bought authors and too many bought books. And it has spawned a kind of literature of uh, glorification, which has caused a kind of equal and opposite uh, reaction in a, in a literature of damnation. Uh, we really wanted to go down the middle path and see this family realistically. And so while we wanted a kind of cooperation, that is, we wanted to be able to interview people and talk to them, uh, we didn't want any, any kind of official status for this book. The relationship between John Kennedy, President Kennedy, and his older brother who was killed in the war was, um, I didn't realize, quite as competitive. Um, in fact, um, the mission that Joe Kennedy, the older brother of President Kennedy, was killed on was a direct result, it sounds like, of that competitiveness. Can you tell me about that? Right. Well, uh, one of the things you understand is that the Kennedy family has had a, a stake in perpetuating a series of myths about it. One of the myths, of course, is that a very close-knit, emotionally uh, bonded family. One of the things we discovered early on was that you know, Joseph Kennedy, who is really one of the most fascinating men, I think, in contemporary American history, had broken out of this Irish uh, Catholic uh, ghetto, of, ghetto of the mind, if not of the body, in Boston and gotten into the mainstream American society. He'd really liberated himself from all the constraints, both financial and emotional. He had, he had uh, had this celebrated liaison with Gloria Swanson, and he'd really uh, become a kind of a maverick. He had brought women into the house to live with him uh, for long periods of time. He had, had a, he had arrived at a kind of understanding with Rose, and uh, I think that her, her way of survival was to deny a lot, a lot of what was going on was going on. In any case, these children, really the children of Joe and Rose, uh, rather than the two of them architecting their fate, these children in a sense raised themselves. They were the one that, that promoted the idea of the family. They were in a sense emotional orphans. And so there's a tremendous closeness. You found them becoming god godparents for each other inside the family, reinforcing these bonds. But there's also a tremendous competitiveness, particularly between the two older sons, Joseph Jr. and Jack. And Joseph Jr. had been the one that the, the father had seen as his kind of fallback position in case he, the father, didn't make the kind of political career he hoped to. He wanted Joseph Kennedy Jr. to be his kind of prosthetic device to, to go on. The trouble was that Jack was this incredibly... Um, energetic and appealing young man and he had had this heroism in PT 109 in the Pacific and the older brother felt that he had to in some sense regain his primacy in that family so he undertook it what was really a suicide mission in England and he died and it, it's amazing because everybody says that of course Joe Kennedy jr. might have been governor might have been senator but he didn't have it to go all the way he was too rigid and unyielding hmm. we have some other pictures here of the Kennedy family uh, we can take a look at on the monitor and just kind of Tell us who we're, who we're looking at uh, and what we're seeing. Well, this is uh, Rose with, with the family. It is terribly appealing. Those are the first three children. Uh, now you see the family really growing up, becoming the family we came to expect. See Jack uncharacteristically kissing his father. Uh, uncharacteristically? Right. Jack was a touch-me-not in many ways. He had this terrible physical illness when he was young. I and mean, one of the things we discovered was that the, uh, a group of letters, probably the only unexpurgated example of Jack's private correspondence that, that we're likely to see in this century, and it shows the extent to which he believed he was going to die as a young man. He had this terrible illness. He called it walking leukemia. Later on, they would diagnose it as Addison's disease. Here we have David Kennedy, um, a terribly tragic young man, uh, victim in some sense of the Kennedy family rather than beneficiary of it. Yeah, we, um, yeah and the book is, is current enough that you talk about the phenomena or the, uh, like you say, the tragic events around the death of David Kennedy. B briefly, um, did you say the Kennedy pressure led directly to his de well, I, death? Well, I think that in these family matters, you know, it, it doesn't do to be too judgmental. But the fact was that uh, 
David Kennedy was under tremendous pressure by the family because of this book, which he had, in some sense, cooperated with, no more than others of his generation. But in the Kennedy family, there's always been this tendency to, to uh, find one member of the generation that, in some sense, expresses and exorcises the weakness of the entire generation. For the pri prior generation, it had been Rosemary, the retarded girl whom they, as we discovered, had uh, lobotomized and, uh, in a sense, put out of the picture, although that, too, is a kind of oversimplification. But in this generation, it was David. And that last weekend of his life, particularly, he was under tremendous pressure because he had talked to us, because he had been part of this project. And um, he was called the bane of the Irish and informer by one of his brothers. He really ostracized as he a really, Kennedy. It was kind of a social death for him. And it's, it's one of the strange things that we've, we determined here is uh, one of the last people he talked to said, that the last words that David Kennedy said is that our, were that uh, he was the rosemary of his generation, that he felt that he was going to be put away by the Kennedys. Whether that's true or false, he felt that he was in danger of really disappearing from the scene. Mm. Well, we're just about out of time. I, let me ask you one quick, one quick question if we can, because we are out of time. Is there anyone in charge now? Is Teddy the, in charge? Well, he, he's certainly in charge of his own political future, but he but doesn't I mean, seem to be in charge of the family. The family feels that it's without an anchor, that role that, that vanished when Bobby Kennedy died. So there, so there is no one making family decisions Certainly anymore? the young people don't feel so. Mm, interesting. Well, the book, again, is called The Kennedys, An American Dream, and it's a, a, a four-year worth of effort on the part of Peter Collier, and it's a compelling story as a, by a, by about a compelling family, no question about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll be right back. <laughs> There's three good reasons to listen to KSTP Talk Radio in the afternoon. Mike Edwards and Russ Small. Sensational. It's summer and sensational protection from dueling optical. Ultraviolet rays can damage your eyes. For your protection, Ray-Ban sunglasses bans over 98% of harmful rays. For protection against glare for driving or water sports, there's nothing better than a Polar Guard polarized lens. Hot at Dueling, get 50% off Polar Guard lenses and Ray-Ban sunglasses. Save 50% at all frames and extended wear contact lenses. Dueling Optical, the hottest prices on quality eyewear. Sensational. Hey, look, we don't want you to worry about a thing. You work for an outfit that cares about its people. So you have a little accident. We'll take care of everything. Your back, your arm, your paycheck. You don't need a lawyer. You've got us. If you're injured on the job, you stand to lose a lot. Protect your legal rights. Call the law firm of Millivets and Associates. Don't forget, you owe us for the equipment you landed on. You live in a city that specializes in the arts. From theater to film, from music to dance. That's why Channel 5's Eyewitness News has entertainment specialist Arthur Ballot to cover it all for you. He'll help you discover the best of the Twin Cities entertainment scene. Don't go out until you've heard from entertainment specialist Arthur Ballard. It is time for our third super bargain of the day, today being Monday with three super bargains. And our third super bargain is a super donut deal from Winchell's Donut House. Now, Winchell's Donut House has 17 Twin Cities locations, as well as in Rochester, and they're offering our viewers something special. Now, Winchell's Donuts House uh, lets you be a kid just about every day by offering practically every kind of donut and sweet roll treat you can imagine. I'm looking at some right there, and here's the deal. If you go into any location today or tomorrow and ask for the Super Bargain, you will get half off of every kind of dozen that you can make up. Mix them and match them any way you want to. You make up a dozen, and they'll sell them to you for half price. And those prices normally start at $3.98 and go up. You make up the dozen, and they'll sell it to you for half price. Now, you want to consult your telephone directory for the nearest location near you. There are a number of Winchells in and around the Twin Cities. And, of course, always ask for the good company Super Bargain. And if you aren't sure exactly where Winchells is, you can always ask any policeman. Cops always know where, where Winchells are. Sharon. Thanks, Jerry. If you have ever thought for a moment that history is a little dry, maybe a little dull, I have a book for you. It is about history. It is written by a local woman, but what history? It is, uh, there you see it right now, it's called By Influence and Desire, and it's the story of a woman named the Grand, who was the Grand Dunch Duchess of Corland 
and her two daughters, these women were of the nobility, they were very wealthy, and they were the wives and mistresses of some of the most powerful people in history. It's a fascinating book and a fascinating subject. The author is with us today. Would you please welcome Rosalind Flaum. <laughs> Rosalind Flaum, got it now. <laughs> Rosalind, I think it's interesting that um, a woman from Wyzetta is writing a history. Now, these women lived in the late 1700s, early 1800s in Central Europe. How did that all come about for you to write this? Well, I've just always been very interested in French history, and I have written four books, and they've all been on French history. And I must correct you, though, excuse me, but it is the 19th century, early 19th century, this particular book, because it deals with the right. time of Napoleon. The so we have 1800s. To, that's right. right. We, we have to move it up a little okay. bit like that. So uh, I've always been interested in his, French history and things to do with France. And the big problem has always been when you do write, you want a book that somebody's going to read. And the American public basically has always been interested, you know, when Louis XIV, Louis XVI, or Napoleon. So you are restricted. And mm -hmm. I was lucky in this instance to find some, some very interesting people who lived at the time of Napoleon I. They were interesting. <laughs> Let's talk a little about the lifestyles. That's what took me so when I was reading the book. Yes. Uh, tell us about how they lived. Well, I think, well, I, I, are you speaking from the point of view of their marriages and that sort of thing, or the well, fact they had so much money? let's talk about the opulence first, just the well, way they traveled, for one thing. Well, this family, they were the re reigning family of Courland. Now, I'm sure nobody in this country, or very few, had ever heard of Courland. Mm -hmm. I hope a lot will, and they'll read the book. But Courland, uh, became Latvia, if you want to be to try to bring it up to date. And they owned the country. It was not a very large country, but they owned it outright. And eventually, Catherine the Great of Russia bought the country, and so they had even more money. And in those days, you know, when you traveled, you carried everything with you. I think that's one of the things that might interest you. Uh, I think when they traveled, they traveled with something like 50 wagons. They had a cook. They carried all their spices. They carried as much food as they could. Uh, they carried, well, they even had, if you want to be very vulgar, uh, toilet seats, things we don't ever think about, but, but these were <laughs> very important, satellites. you know, and they had to, well, that's a much, much more polite way of putting it. They carried their own furniture. Uh, you know, one forgets, even in Russia in those days, for example, because Krillin was very near Russia, and they did go to Russia, that when the, emp the royal family, the Tsar and the Tsarina of, of Russia traveled, they took their furniture from, from one of their palaces to the next because they didn't have a lot. So you had to be prepared to travel with everything. And oh I think one of the things that interested me, and you just take it for granted, that when you travel like the Grand Duchess did all over Europe, and she spent a lot of time traveling, you even have one carriage that has nothing but, but a, a blacksmith to take care of your, uh, well, the of horses course, and everything. Course, and then about 50 horses, 50 horses went with them so that they could... Uh, the, uh, excuse me to interrupt you, but I want to move on to this next subject because the other thing that is so fascinating about the book is the morality, or lack of morality, I guess, as we look at it now. There's actually a time when uh, the Duchess sits down with her, uh, with her two lovers at the same table. Uh, then they have tea, or her husband sets her up in a house that she can live with her lover for half of the year. I mean, <laughs> unheard of things. Now, was this uh, just a sign of the times, or was this a privilege of the privileged to have these kinds of well, relationships? Well, you're absolutely right. This was a privilege of the privileged. That's perfectly true. But one must also remember, you have to take it in context. These marriages were all arranged, as in this book, the youngest daughter, she wanted to marry somebody else at the age of 16. She was married off, and not only she didn't want to marry this man, but the mother went through a very elaborate uh, uh, charade in which she claimed that the girl's fiancé to be had become engaged to somebody else. And they had no choice whatsoever about who they were to meet, be married to, particularly if they were the upper class and they brought with them a lot of money, a lot of land. So since it was arranged, they didn't have any problems about taking lovers? Though? Absolutely none. The only thing is they had to play the game, so to speak. I mean, they had to abide by the rules. And the rules were that you were discreet. Mm -hmm. And if you had a child, and they had many illegitimate children, you simply had to not admit it was your child. You know, it could be brought up by somebody else. Very often you never would see the child again, or it would be brought back, and it would be brought up as the, your cousin's child or your best friend's child mm -hmm. or somebody like that. We just have 30 seconds left, but what is it? These women were so able to attract men. What is it about them that was so attractive to men? Well, they had charm, which is very hard to define. That's the one word you see, hear about all the time, but they were very smart. Smart. They were very smart, and a lot of times, uh, Maeterlinck, who was the chancellor of the Holy Roman Empire in Austria, 
said that he enjoyed talking with Wilhelmina, who was his mistress. She understood him and his problems, political problems, better than any of his ministers. Well, I tell you, if you think General Hospital's hot stuff, <laughs> <laughs> this really beats it. It really does. It's great. It's called By Influence and Desire. And once again, Rosalind Flom is its author. Thank you for being with us, Rosalind. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Northern bathroom tissue is quilted with flowers for extra softness. Quilted Northern is so soft, you can actually see it. But mostly, you can feel it. Northern, for softness you can see and feel. Well, the hoop de doo is a brand new scoop. Glory old cookies and cream. You can't get enough of this a heavenly stuff. New Oreo cookies and cream. We crunch those cookies in a cream ice cream. Is everybody truly? Yes, indeed. U.S. of A. It's in your lucky day. New Oreo cookies and cream. Ice cream. On a stick and sandwiches, too. Time takes you beyond the news. Time flies and you are there. Time cries and lets you care. You understand the world we share. When you read Time each week, you know more. You understand. Throughout your world, throughout your land, time puts it all right in your hand. Read Time and understand. Now what do they want? Well, Paris has a great thirst in the land. Oh, come now. There is plenty to drink. Oh. Perhaps they would like some scrumptious swine soup, eh? Oh. Let them drink a cola! Oh. Peasants can be such a pain in their neck, eh? Good afternoon, everyone. Walter Mondale continues to take big steps toward a unified party convention in San Francisco. Today, he picked up the key endorsement from Massachusetts Senator Ted Kennedy. The space shuttle Challenger is still on the ground today. A, transplant, a bad computer problem kept the Challenger on the ground. It should go off in the next couple of days. And lending banks today endorsed a higher lending rate, up to 13%. That could mean higher interest rates for us. We'll have more news at 4.30. If you're looking for something fun to do with the whole family next Sunday, we have an event for you. This is Ron Miles representing the Brainerd Little Falls chapter of the Mississippi River Revival. And going on next Sunday is what, Ron? We're having an all-day rain or shine uh, folk festival that's going to feature some of the top uh, Midwestern entertainers who are, by the way, donating all of their ta time and talent for this this. So it's going to be a, a very good super deal, I think. So for, it's a music festival going on all day? Yes, from uh -huh. 10 o'clock in the morning until sunset. And we're asking for a $2 donation if you buy one of these buttons in advance or uh, $3 at the, at the door. Okay, and there's the location, the Bell Plain Park. And for more information, you can call 861-3308. Good luck with that. It sounds Thank like fun. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Gary? Hmm. Thank you, Sharon. Coming up tomorrow on Good Company... We have a person here that's going to teach us how we can all be more productive by doing a series of exercises to help relieve, uh, to relieve stress and tension on the job. Yes, and also a restaurant review. We're going to the new restaurant in 700 under the mall in the new Dayton's area. And we'll meet a fellow who has written a new book outlining the most expensive motion picture flops in history. Like that one right there. Thanks Ooh. for being with us today. Have a good vacation. We're going to give it a good shot. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. For more information about today's good company, call The Connection at 941-2501. And for information on retail sales and specials, call The Connection. That's 941-2501. Transportation for the guests and crew of Good Company provided by Republic Airlines. 